We are live. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Gerald. I'm Andy. And I'm Anise. And this week, in an effort to break away from my usual Carve magazine, Good But Not Brilliant Fair, we've been reading The Seraph and the Zambezi by Muriel Spark. This was a short story which launched her writing career by beating nearly 7,000 other entrants in an Observer short story competition in 1951. Our story is set in a rundown hotel, come petrol station, come garage, come theatre, close to Victoria Falls on the Zambia-Zimbabwe border in South Africa. The owner of said establishment puts on an nativity mask for the entertainment of his guests and some locals, where he is to play a seraph, a kind of angel. However, before the performance can begin, he is confronted by a real seraph, who arrives with burning heat and upstages our host. The real seraph won't leave, so some locals pour petrol into the theatre, which is ignited by the heat from the seraph. The garage come theatre is destroyed, and the seraph is driven away to cool his burns in the Zambezi River. The end. Cool. All right. So what did you guys think of the story overall? Let's start with Andy, who's been making some sure of slack. Well, it's it's definitely a break from the good stories from your magazine. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. It was just ponderous. And I know, so Gerald talks about the iceberg all the time. And while reading this, I felt like I was on the tip of the iceberg, but I did not care what was underneath. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm probably missing something. Do I want to excavate and find out more meaning? No, no. Why do you think that is? I don't. Why do you think you did not want? I mean, there's literally a, a sassy seraph in this. How can you not? I know. I thought I'd be super excited about a seraph. And yeah. it had six wings and, and burning. And it, that's everything you want in an angel, really. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell, there's one sentence for me that symbolizes the whole story. Right at the beginning. For instance, in those days, more than a hundred years ago, Kramer had persisted for several decades and without affectation in being about 25 years old. That's nonsense, and it took 12 times as long to say the nonsense as it needed to. <laughs> it's a meandering, just ponderous sentence full of nothing. I like, oh, that don't like the it. first part of the short story. I'm like, I don't know what this is, why this is here, but okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, Gerald, what did you That's think? not the whole tone. No. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I, I think some time ago I would have been like Andy and said, this is ridiculous. It just makes no sense. No, I can't understand it. It's rubbish. But actually, if you sort of let go of, of, of the, the trammels in which the you normally sort of read – normal fiction if you like and if you say okay the guy's over 100 years old plus somewhat um but that's okay we'll accept that because it it's it means something and and you you just you embrace the weird it's i don't i don't know it's kind of it's kind of strange uh, because i really enjoyed it i i loved the writing um i enjoyed the story um uh, yeah, the ending not so much, but, but the ending seemed a bit rushed. But um, hey, she beat seven thousand other writers. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I like the story. It's funny in the um, summary, Gerald. You said that he was that the the seraph. I don't know why I said seraph. Seraph. Um, say, but, say what feels good in your heart. Seraph. I do this all the time, where words that I'm used to reading but not saying out loud, my instincts for what syllable I should emphasize is wrong. More hmm. often than not. Like well, I, I only I, mm -hmm. I only go by by a hymn, uh, the song we used to sing, or a hymn we used to sing. I think it was a was it a carol. Thus came the seraph, and and forthwith appeared a shining throng, and mm. it was a seraph. So otherwise, I wouldn't know. Yeah, seraph. Okay, so I, you said in your summary that the seraph jumped into the river to cool down his burns, and I didn't read it like that at all, which is very interesting. Uh, oh, okay. I don't think it was, I didn't think it was injured. He's this supernatural, godly, otherworldly being who's been here since the beginning. Still fire ain't gonna hurt him. But he is fire, basically. But um, that that's a minor point. 
I really like the story. I don't know why I liked it the first time I read it because I know that by the end, I liked the fact I had a good time reading it, but I couldn't have told you what it's about at all <laughs> the first time. I'm like, I don't know why I like this. Uh, yeah. And then on the second read through and after a little bit of research about Muriel Spark and things started to click and come together a little bit, then I really started to get some actual meaning out of it that I really enjoyed. Um, so yeah, so I liked it and it aged well in the course of, you know, a couple hours, but it, it <laughs> aged well, <laughs> it aged well in my reception of it. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, but let's, let's um, yeah. start with Kramer because as Gerald said, he's over a hundred years old. And I don't know what that has to do with anything other than like biblical human characters tend to be over a hundred years old. So it like puts you in the right frame of mind. That's all I can think of. And it's dumb and unnecessary. Like I don't know why he's over a hundred years old. Yeah. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Nope. <laughs> I thought it was just uh, like a metaphor. Like, oh, this guy, he's been the same guy forever. I don't know. Maybe yeah, he is a hundred years old. Possibly. It could just be like hyperbole. Like this guy. Yeah. People- about him for as long as I can remember. I don't know. It, but it could be literal. I mean, an angel shows up halfway through in order to put on a play. Yeah. Could be literal. Okay. Well, yeah, there's a seraph. So he says, Here I am. Did you, did, would you guys look up images of seraphs, uh, the medieval paintings, where it's literally just a child's head, no body, and six wings, like a flower around the head, floating in the air. Like some of the medieval arts of seraphs are like bananas. Like these people were high. Oh. Well, yeah. Well, there's a reason every time you see an angel, the first thing it says is "Don't be afraid." They, they look like <laughs> monsters. There's some there just wheels of fire. There's like a guy with a hundred eyes. Like there's some creepy angels, man. <laughs> I swear I'm a good guy. You're a floating yeah, like, head. Right, Don't I'm a floating afraid. head with 12 sets of wings. Don't freak <laughs> out. It's fine. I'm going to tell you about a baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, who, who's Kramer? What type of person is he? Well, he's... he's I don't know. He, he's, he's, he's kind of a... He's, he's kind of an organizer. He's, he's, he's kind of a... Like the the center of attention is he, you know he he wants to be the seraph and and that's that's what he wants to chase the real seraph off because this is my role and this is I I I'm putting this mask play on and I want to be so he's he's I get the feeling he's sort of center of of, of that little community. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he's the guy whose ego is such that. When an actual angel shows up, he's like, no, you can't be in my play. This, this, I'm the guy. I'm the seraph around here. He's like, I'm literally a seraph. <laughs> no, nope. Get out of my play. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we're not supposed to like Kramer. I don't like Kramer. <laughs> and especially because there's a parallel that I caught the second time around where I read it, where the way that he treats the natives, right? So all of those people who are in the play and audience or in the audience are colonists. They're all yeah. Europeans, um, but the natives, there's that line how like the natives, because they're not, neither in the cast or the audience, aren't really caring too much about setting up the chairs and stuff. And then Kramer like rips into them. And then it says how he ends the conversation by mentioning the word police. And then he's ripping into the seraph and he ends the conversation by threatening to call the police. I love that parallel um, because you know he thinks he's above the natives and then he does the exact same things to the seraph. Yes. I like that parallel a lot. Uh, and when I did some research about Muriel Spark, um, so she had a brief but violent marriage. So she's Scottish, her husband's Scottish, but he was going to go to Rodi, what was called at the time Rhodesia in Africa. And um, she, she had utter disgust for the other colonists. She thought they were all racist, like her husband, and just the worst. So a lot of times when her stories, they're not always set in Africa, but when they are, the colonists are usually like the worst people. <laughs> there, yeah. there was a lot of casual racism tossed around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she was very aware of that. Like, you know how sometimes when there's a, a writer like Muriel Spark who won't tell you what you're supposed to think, and then you see casual racism, and you're like, is this happening because Muriel Spark's a racist and thought that was fine and normal? Or is this happening as a critique 
of racism and she's shining a light on it. and you can't tell because there's some writers who will tell you these people suck and then other yeah. writers who won't tell you so then doing the research then i understood oh no she was writing this with eyes wide open that this is racism okay that makes me feel a little better i still think the story's garbage <laughs> and, and it's kind of hard writing about racism without a writer feeling that they might be perceived as being racist themselves it, it's like how can you write about this without understanding racism and and being partially racist yourself and i think it's a, it's a bit the same about I, I was once spoke to a writer who, who'd written a story about uh, child molestation and and i said i just couldn't do that he said it's a story i'm creating a fiction it's and it's it's almost like as a writer, can you be can you be tainted by the stories that you write? So I I, I sometimes wonder. I and I, I you know I would I would always want to put other people as as the racist racist, not the the sort of first person narrator or something like that. Yeah, you know, I, I couldn't do that. I I wouldn't want to be perceived as as having a, any of those negative traits. Mm. Yeah, and I think with something like your example with the child molestation, like one of the things it's are you including it as a way to um, say something about the way that kids yes. are preyed upon? Like, are you making a comment about that? Or is it window dressing that you just think is fun? There's a difference there, isn't there? Yeah. 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 And it's funny. I, I, was, I, was, I was grumbling a lot of this, um, you know, the Fifty Shades of Grey thing. She's she's written another a, a different story, a different line. You know, it's the same old nonsense. And, and you think... Can, can you write this sort of stuff and not be sort of into it in some way? I don't know. Okay, well, we all know E.L. James is 100% into it. But uh, <laughs> yeah. shades of gray aside, I, mean, I think it is possible to write about it without being into it. Like when we read, um, uh, I'm trying to think, like in The Sympathizer, there's that horrible mm -hmm. rape scene, right? And I didn't get the sense that the author here is like getting some kind of exploitative thrill out of it because of the way that the subject was handled. And I think uh, the way that something is framed and revealed says a lot. Um, but again, when you have an author like Muriel Spark, who really is hiding her intentions at all times, you're not sure, especially with some of the older writers where it's like, but your contemporaries thought this was fine. So I don't know where you stand. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like when we read that, um, that Lovecraft short story, The Village. And it was just like the most racist thing ever. And then we yeah. do some research and what do we discover? Oh no, he actually was like a huge xenophobe and racist. Yeah, he's super <laughs> racist. <laughs> so, like, well, in that case, your instinct that the author is just super racist was right. You never know. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> and it's yeah. funny because like Lovecraft, when you look at his like more Lovecraftian horror, you know, like space alien monsters, gods, that can still be a lot of fun, despite the fact that he's racist. But then when you read The Village, which is not about any of that, and it's literally just like, why isn't America more white? It's like, oh, no, stop. I wish I'd never read this. <laughs> this I, I started and I thought this would be a parody, but no, you're, you're a monster. <laughs> you're a monster. I wish I'd never read this. <laughs> and yet so, yet so many writers write about death and killing and serial killers and 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 they they don't have any fears about being so obviously i'm not a murderer obviously i'm not a serial killer but mm. but but some of the more sort of is it licentious is that a right word so but some of the more sort of the, the more spectacular crimes mm. um you do wonder whether the the person is, is sort of has some has some skin in the game as it were. <laughs> Mm, yeah yeah and again it also it always depends on how it comes out i turn back to that sympathizer example where you don't ever think the author is you know you can see what they're doing um yeah, yeah. okay so back to this story oh yes yeah, sorry Kramer sucks and he's a racist <laughs> yeah <laughs> um what about the, the fanfare though first of all just the fact that she's referred to as the the fanfare, yeah <laughs> that'd be that's, that's I, I just I, I I gave a little smirk whenever I read that. I just think I don't know why she did it, but it's it's quite funny. <laughs> the fan father did this. Probably for that smirk, it's very funny. Yeah. 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 Because because she was you know she was a sort of almost larger than life character in 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 you know in olden times, and 
you know, she's this big sort of impresario type person and dance tutor and, and, and all this. So yeah, she, I suppose she, referring to her as a sort of indefinite article, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's quite funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Andy, any thoughts on the Fen Farlow? I mean, it's right. It's the Seraph and the Zambezi and the Fen Farlow and also Kramer. The Kramer. Kramer. Just the Kramer. He's just a Kramer. He doesn't get the, but it started with, I don't know if you've heard about this half journalist, half poet. Like, you know, like there's already a, a, a sense of, of he's some sort of bigger character from right from the beginning. Yeah, but see, okay. I was reading, it's like, you may have heard of him, uh, but also, if you haven't, it doesn't matter. So, I feel like <laughs> and what, and why doesn't it matter? And then immediately undercut it, because who cares who he is? He right, just ends up being this guy. No, he was a huge jerk. End up being this guy. I think that line on my second read through, it read to me like the world's most glorious diss. Where it was like, "Have you ever heard of this guy? If you haven't, you'll see by the end of this story why that's totally fine." Because he sucks. Yeah. Like, she says, "Like by the end of this story, you'll see why it's fine that you've never heard of him." Right. Yeah. Because he's just some jerk. Yeah, it's a, it's a good diss. <laughs> she starts with a diss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about the Seraph a little bit more. He shows up. So what does he want? How do they react to him and how does he leave? <laughs> <laughs> and we'll start with you since you're laughing. Well, so, at you know, who knows what he originally wanted? He just showed up and then he found out there was a play. He's like, oh, great. We'll do a play. We'll do my play, which is better <laughs> than your play because I'm a Seraph. And then they throw gasoline on him. So he's like, oh, well, forget this. I'll just leave. And then he leaves. I don't know. <laughs> okay, I thought he didn't show up and then discovered there's a play. He showed up because there's a play. Okay, this I is the best. Too, yeah. I yeah. don't know. He, he he showed up and halfway through the argument with Kramer, Kramer's like, "No, I'm putting on a play." He's like, "Oh, cool. Let's do a play then. We'll do my play." Yeah, but even before that, already he was he was basically like, "You're not doing a good job at being a seraph." Well, uh, so like, did he show up because this guy was dressed as a seraph? He's like, "I find this personally insulting." Like your <laughs> Seraph costume. That's why he's here. <laughs> I don't know. I think he came because he wanted to be in it. But I like when he goes, um, uh, yeah, the Seraph goes, um, so Kramer goes, this is my property and these people have paid for their seats. They'll come to see a mask. In that case, I'll cool down and they can come and see my mask. That's the Seraph. And then Kramer goes, my mask. And then the Seraph goes, <laughs> ah, no, mine, yours won't do. <laughs> Uh, will you go? Uh, yeah, and then that's when Kramer goes. Will you go, or shall I call the police? And then this, this Seraph says, "I have no alternative." More finally, still, like he has to do this. Um, their whole conversation was really funny. I I think it's hilarious that that this this sort of six winged angel creature, you know, made of fire, comes down to earth. And, and and wants to be in a play and he's arguing with it. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> yeah. And I also like when, when Kramer goes, um, do I look like a fool? And the seraph goes, No, nor a surf either. <laughs> 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 oh, that's a lot of good jokes in there. Um, when Kramer's like, This is my mask. I've been here since the start. And then the seraph goes, well, it's been mine from the beginning, and the beginning began first. Nice. <laughs> yeah. that's, a, that's a great line, that. That oh, was very funny. Okay, so they argue with him, and then a bunch of locals are like, they think it's a leopard, so they want to start a fire to scare the leopard. And then Kramer, who knows it's not a leopard and knows about the heat that's in there, encourages them to do this. Um, where he says... Yeah, young troopers had video blinding the leopard with petrol. They went to go find some petrol cans. This will fix them. And then Kramer says, that's right, let him have it. Like, knowing he's the only person in this fire plot who knows it's a serif. Uh. <laughs> this, this, this is my favorite line. Uh, the story's still garbage. I hate it. This is my favorite line. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> my policy covers everything except acts yes. of God, so I'll be fine. It's literally an angel. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> My policy calls that everything except that to God. That means lightning or flood. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is covered. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's very funny. Yeah. This yeah. Is... Also, two things. One, except acts of God. Yeah, and I think also acts of like arson, like self-imposed arson. You you burned it down yourself. Because you would oh, rather yeah. burn down your makeshift theater than let an actual seraph play a seraph. Yes. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Which is great. It's just how detestable are these people? So then the seraph runs off. They're chasing him. And Gerald, you were saying that you think he ran to the river because he was wounded. Maybe, maybe not. I, I don't know if it's because of that or not. But then, so how does the seraph leave? And what did you guys think of that um, ending? Uh, da, da, da. Where it actually left? Mm -hmm. Well, when they're chasing him, the whole river scene. Yeah, the, it, I don't know. That That's why I think he's... he's because they, they said two of the, you know, two wings are covered his face, two are covered his feet. I don't know whether that's well. I mean, does he does he does he just appear, or does he? I mean, he obviously flies in this case with his other two wings on his back. So I don't know how seraphs normally travel, but I, I got the feeling that he was he he went straight into the into the falls because of of all the extra steam. So I presumed. That that's where, um, that's why he went there because he was he was injured. Mm. Oh, yeah, I just, just thought he was leaving. Yeah, he's just bouncing. He's like, all right, bye, guys. Guess there's no more play to be had. But why would he go into? Because because they said that he was, they couldn't see him, and and the only what, reason they knew he was there because of the amounts of steam that were. May, maybe he's. Maybe he's not normally hot. Maybe he's, I don't know. Maybe he's normally cool and, and I don't know. No. Yeah. It's a mystery. Well, I don't think it matters too much while he was running no. away. I think one of the things that I thought was, um, is that final image that Spark very deftly puts in your mind, which is by the mute flashes of summer lightning. We watched him ride the Sembesi away from, uh, from us among the rocks that look like crocodiles and the crocodiles that look like rocks. Like, yeah. what's more, just what's the greater show here? Like, this, like, play where, like, this guy's wrapped a mosquito net to make a toga and there's, like, there's, like, tissue paper wings or, like, this actual glowing Sarah <laughs> rushing down a river um, that you can only see him when lightning is crashing. Otherwise, it's all dark. So it's, like, you know, a staccato, like, snippets of it. Like yeah. the much better show of like God's awesome work than like compared to this terrible little play that we're going to put on. And and I think this is one of the key things about the story, isn't it? That that man, well, I don't know how 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 you would you would say it, but but sort of man shuns God in favor of a false god, sort mm -hmm. of thing. So you know they're all going to see a, a a play put on by this this old guy who runs this crappy old run down place um and yet a real seraph shows up and and no we don't want him we don't want him and 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 get rid of him so they you know they they shun it's a bit like there's a line in in um zen and the art of motorcycle engines that where it says um truth comes knocking at your door and you say go away because i'm trying to find the truth or some something like that so it's it's, it's like ignoring the truth because you're busy looking for the truth somewhere else. Mm. Okay. Andy, what did you think of that ending? I mean, I thought it was pointless. Like, why Why the guy even show up, man, if you're just going to fly down the river? I also thought, for getting half the billing in the title, the Zambezi certainly didn't, didn't get a lot of play. But what about my explanation of, like, how it's, this show that's being put on right now with the Seraph and the Simbizi, like that's the name of that play. It's like this story. Yeah. Of, you know, if you look at it that way, then it does get a lot of billing because it's not about the Christmas nativity that happened. <laughs> you know the I'm only saying? important thing was this, this yeah. bit at the end, everything else was nonsense. Well, not that it was yeah. nonsense, but just basically like what, what is worthy of our attention? Yeah. Well, it's it's the rocks that look like crocodiles and the crocodiles that look like rocks, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. Like the story, I think, is about um, that ego, especially the ego of colonists. I think making a colonist is um, 
because I have an extra inflated sense of ego because of people that they have oppressed, <laughs> you know, like, you know, right. It's not, it's, you're not picking like the downtrodden, like coal miners who work 12 hours a day to make a pittance. Right. It's like people who already have this inflated sense of self for no reason, really. <laughs> yeah. 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 Be, because they come from a, a, a civilized westernized country and, and they assumed and we seem to be seeing a lot of it here at the moment. They assume that they are better than everybody else. So, you know, we know best. We've come to colonize you, and um, this is, you know, we're bringing Christianity because that's what you want, really. And and these people are quite happy with their own religions and their own beliefs and their own understandings. And before we and and other many European countries came along and helped them out. Yeah. <clears throat> I apologize for my ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> we did some bad stuff. Yeah. Well, and so as I did some research on Muriel Spark, it, um, a lot of her biographers point to this story as two turns from her. First, a turn from mostly doing poetry to mostly doing prose. And the second turn is, um, this is when she started to become, uh, she converted to Catholicism. She wasn't a Catholic. Oh. And that I think is her first or second novel after this one. Um, so one of the ideas that persists throughout her work, as you don't quite see in this one yet, but that she thinks about further down the line, is um, a parallel between the way that um, God can imbue things with the sacrament. Writers can imbue things with meaning through literary works. Her conversion was very much literary based. It was through reading literature of Catholics that she was converted. And um, in one of her novels, I think called The Comforters, the main character is a woman who discovers she is the, a character in a fictional play. And then it turns out it's her own fictional play. She's writing her own play. So she is both controlled by this like greater like authority. And she also is that authority who's imbuing meaning in everything. It's very trippy. She also mm. had later in life where she was like on weight loss pills and never ate anything and started hallucinating and going crazy. But like her life, like her her life story is super interesting. So interesting. Did is, did she end up in Italy? Is that the one? I don't know. Maybe not. I don't, um, I don't think somebody, she did. Oh no! It's somebody else who who died recently. With the, I can't remember. But she did who die it in Italy, actually. Yes, she did. When did that happen? I think oh. I got as far as when I was reading her quick bio, I got as far as um, uh, when she went to Israel to report on um, a trial and then she was trying to work on her magnum opus and it was kind of a dud. But then a second book she wrote while she was there was considered one of her greater. So the, the prime of Miss Jean Brody that she wrote at the same time as she was trying to write her magnum opus, the prime of Miss Jean Brody, which is not what she considered, what she wanted to be her greatest work, turned out to be one of her greatest works. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember watching that on the TV when I was much, much younger. And and it's such a, even, even then I just thought, wow, this is a story of a school teacher, but it's so much more. There's so much more in it. It's, amazing story yeah there's so much i think also like in late life she takes up a partner who's another woman at a time when like that's not happening you know what i'm saying like it's yeah. the piece. yeah there's a lot of stuff in it i i, I tell you what it is who i was thinking of because um i somebody on the radio has written a biography of her and went to the place where she lived with her partner and met her ex-partner and 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 built this amazing story so so she herself was a, a fantastic character a, um and, and a little bit eccentric and a little bit weird and, and they lived in this this you know this separate place that was that was in a tiny village and it's quite difficult to find um so really interesting um interesting life she led oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Mm. okay Andy, has this discussion changed your reception of the story at all? You know, a little, and I'm super interested to hear more about her life, but I still go back to the fact that I hated reading this story. The ideas behind it, especially discussing them with you, seem very interesting. But getting those words into my eyeballs was a tedious <laughs> process, and I did not enjoy it. So why do you think that is? 
it's this weird style she has and it's just it's it's heavy it's not light like you have to work for every paragraph really yeah do you I, feel that way yeah it's it's not in the same way um when i when i read it a second time i thought i'll just skim through it quickly but i couldn't you can't so you can't just quit you read through it and, and read the story and, and get it into your head. You do have to read all the words because there's, I don't know, it, it's a funny style that that makes you slow down and makes you read it more slowly. Um, but so so I love, yeah, I love the style of the writing. I I, I love I love how she writes and um, and and I thought I thought the yeah the, the story is a bit weird and and funny but interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I I didn't I hear what um, Andy's saying where it's not like it's definitely not a story where like you just read it quickly and you're getting everything. But it didn't feel necessarily that um, difficult either. I it felt like honestly like very literary, right? Like it had those long sentences that were putting things that normally. Like just simple things, like she's driven out of the uh, out of the garage by the heat, right? Like where different things are doing. You have different subjects and objects, and just flipping around things in ways that can feel very artistic. Um, that I think also comes from her background uh, as a poet. And I wonder if four years ago, over four years ago now, when we started this podcast, if I would have not enjoyed that exercise as much. Um, Probably. I probably would have found it not pretentious, but just like, why? Like, why make it so mm. busy? But now I'm starting to appreciate it more um, because it just, she's putting emphasis on different things, often with meaning, right? Like when you're being driven out of the garage by heat, but you're saying this after the seraph appears, that heat is different, that heat is supernatural. Like one thing that I've, I've learned a lot from reading stories, like good literary writers, all those little things that just seem like some flight of fancy about a writing style, they put a lot of thought into it, right? Um, there's, a, there's a way in which that those little flips, the, the change in syntax normally is conveying something or, or continuing a certain theme in a, in a way. Yeah, yeah it, I think it's interesting because, as, as you say, when, when, he, when the serif first defeat, uh, appears and you get the um, you get notes about the, uh, the makeup dripping off people's faces and it's hot, it's unbearably hot, and... Um, but but that sort of heat builds. It's it's it, it's it's like um, it's hot and then it's hotter and then it's hotter. When once the um, yeah, w once they've done the the petrol thing, um, yeah, the seats caught light first. Then the air itself began to burn within the metal walls till the whole interior was flame feeding on flame. And you just think it all of a sudden it's like it's like an inferno. It's like the um, Notre Dame the other day. Um, it, it's it's like it's out of control almost. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a different kind of heat. Um, yeah, very. I think it's very cleverly done. Yeah, yeah. And I think reading more and more writing that puts this much thought into what what noun is doing what to which noun, like even just at that level, <laughs> has made me appreciate um, that level of craft. Like we're reading Black Leopard, Red Wolf. We've been having a hard time with him for many reasons, but one of the things that I do um, acknowledge is his command of the English language is just on another level because yeah. he has created an entire new way of speaking that I have now been taught. He has taught me the way that these people speak, which is not the way that we speak, and I can recognize it as being very distinct to this world that he created. And you can only do that when you're thinking about sentences at the level of when does the verb come in, right? Because he has a verb come in before you know who's doing what often, right? Like things like that. Yeah, um, yeah, that, and I started so, to appreciate that. Yeah, and some some things I was I was reading some some more today, and 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 he's some of the dialogue and the interplay and the word games that he plays mm -hmm. with people through their dialogue is really really clever. It, it's so yeah, this this. Yeah, <laughs> we'll discuss this next week. But it, it's uh, there's there's things about it which are really really good. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and that, that that command of the English language is just really impressive. How you can make the language do what you want, right? Yeah. Because a lot of more like pulpyish kind of writing, it's very much the voice of that time. It sounds like oh, this is from the fifties. Oh, this is from the early two thousands. Oh, this is the eighteen hundreds. And you just recognize the time because people are speaking like their contemporaries did. But these kinds of writers, they break, they break out of the pack. They don't sound like the contemporaries. They sound like themselves. Yeah. Yeah, and and you have to be very brave to do it. You have to be, mm-hmm. you have to believe in your writing and and the story that you're telling to be able to do it and to do it with conviction and get that across. Yeah, because if you don't do it right, you can just piss off every yes. week, right? Like you can just piss people off, like, like me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, okay. Yeah. Anything else you guys want to add? It, it's it's a story you have to read more than once and preferably more than twice. I, th- I think you... <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> oh, well, arguably, it's a story you could also read zero times. <laughs> <laughs> I think between either less than one or greater than two, I think, are the optimal amount of times to read it. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> Less than one. <laughs> I would say more than one. Yeah. One is definitely wrong. We can all agree reading it once is a disservice. Yeah. Yeah. I think two, you start to get a sort of a flavor for it. And I think three, you can then start to enjoy it. Mm-hmm. This made me want to read that novel about the writer who discovers she's writing her own life. And she's oh, and that character is also converting to Catholicism at the same time. She has a lot of characters that convert, and <laughs> um, and and the point of that story is how there's a parallel between the way that writers imbue meaning and things, and the way that God imbues the sacrament. Like, this is fascinating, lady. I need to read this. Oh. It's, just, okay. it's just different. I've never, and I'm not like super religious, but like that is such a cool concept. Okay. Yeah. So ratings. Um, well, I'll go first. I'll mm-hmm. go with a solid five. Nice. Really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Great. Let's go to Andy next. We can end the high note with me. Uh, you, you brought me up to a three. Wow. I think wow. I'm willing to engage with it on the level of three out of six. Good. Wow. That's I was right. putting in like a 5.5, but I've talked myself up to a full six. Wow. <laughs> Because even the first time I read it, I don't know why I liked it, but I did. So that's cool. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and I think it is one of these stories that, that stays with you and, and yeah. sort of sits at the back of your head, you know, ding, 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 and you think, oh, yeah, I remember that one. Like, like sometimes you, you, you refer to stories that we've read, and I think, I don't remember reading that, but I'll remember reading this one. It's, um, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah, we either remember stories because they stayed with us on the strength of the writing, or our reactions were so powerful, like Delira. Remember Delira? Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> it was a softcore porn. No, it was hardcore porn that we read. Was, yeah. We didn't know what we were getting into. <laughs> <laughs> we were young and foolish. I did. What can I say? Yeah. Okay. So there's no game today because we have a guest next week. We are welcoming um, Katie Hageman. She's an author and illustrator. Uh, we're still working out which story we're going to read. So if you're watching this on YouTube, go check the website sometime soon. If you're listening to this live, you're not going to listen to this at all because I'm going to splice in the story. All right. <laughs> so um, before you go, uh, oh, I did not use proper grammar here. Let me fix this. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's okay. It's fitting with the story. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's harsh. Whoa. <sighs> but sharp, very go, quick. Very quick, very quick. All right. But before you go, let us know about which supernatural beings threatened your fragile ego on our Facebook group, the Literary Roadhouse Readers, or Twitter at the Roadhouse, or our website, literaryroadhouse.com. Wish you could spend more time with godly creations that just love a good amateur theater production. Of course you do. Join the Literary Roadhouse Book Club, where we discuss a novel each month. And lastly, we're looking to put on a Broadway-worthy nativity with a cast full of seraphs. Support our hard turn to religious theater and podcast expenses at patreon.com slash literaryroadhouse. Every bit helps. And as always, share this podcast with the blue-haired aging ballerina in your life. Until next time, read a good story.